Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Easter service. Jesus is risen. Hi, everyone. We've really enjoyed our um, BBC Connect and um, being able to fellowship um, as a family. Um, we've missed the services, but we've really enjoyed um, being able to uh, encourage each other as a family and to sing together and worship with the worship team and um, it's been a lot of fun despite the disruptions and um, I'd just like to encourage you to keep um, enjoying and listening and connecting through this platform so that we are able to still fellowship and worship our Lord together um, in this uh, difficult time um, so I just ask if you would stand with me as I read the call to worship. So this is Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing. With trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn, shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let the sea resound and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Let's uh, bow our heads and open in prayer. Uh, Lord Jesus, we come before you this Easter Sunday, and we just want to praise you and thank you for your work. Uh, you obediently came to this earth, lived among us, suffered and died on a cross, and you were raised from death, defeating its power over us. You made a way for us to come into fellowship with you and uh, to have relationship. And we just, we praise you and we thank you for all that you've done. We bring nothing um, and we give you all the glory. I pray now in this time where this earth is being shaken and many people are lost and hopeless, that they would cling to you. You are the only thing that cannot be shaken in this storm. Um, I just pray that you would work this for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.
attentive, open our hearts and our minds to accept your word. In your name I pray. Amen. Church family, it is a good morning to you and welcome wherever you are today. Uh, exciting that we can come together this morning on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, as we remember what took place over 2,000 years ago as our Lord came back from the grave. Uh, how exciting that must have been as the woman went down to the tomb just at the break of dawn and received the news from the angel, He is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. And so we praise Him and we worship Him. We exalt His holy name as we come together on this Sunday morning. Uh, this morning we are in the uh, third part of our Easter series entitled The Man Jesus. Last Sunday, Palm Sunday, we looked at the man Jesus, his mission. And then a couple of days ago, Easter Friday, we looked at the man Jesus, his crucifixion. And this morning we're going to open up the scriptures and we're going to look at the third part of our series, The Man Jesus, his resurrection. We celebrate today as we've been going through this Easter series, we celebrate a day which not only impacted the course of human history, but we celebrate a day which altered the course of human destiny. And so I'm going to ask if you would open your Bibles to the 28th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. So Matthew chapter 28 is where we're going to be this morning. Um, but we're going to bounce around the four Gospels as we try to get different accounts and pull those accounts together of uh, the resurrection of Jesus. So we'll start in Matthew 28. Uh, you can, if you're taking notes, you can jot down various passages of Scripture as we look at the different Gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus. So turn to Matthew chapter 28. And as we prepare to hear from God's Word, won't you bow your heads as we pray together. Oh, Father, we thank you that we can come together in this Easter Sunday morning and we can celebrate hope that came to a hopeless world 
that we can celebrate life that came to a dead world because of the resurrection of Jesus. And so we come with joy and with gladness in our hearts. We worship you, King Jesus. And as we open up the Scriptures, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would make our eyes to see and our ears to hear, our minds to understand and our hearts to receive your Word today, that we might prove by experience that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And, O oh Lord, I pray that I would be nothing, for I am nothing. And, Jesus, you would be everything, for you are everything. To the praise of your glorious and your wonderful and your outrageous and your scandalous grace to sinners like us. In your precious name, amen. So we are in Matthew chapter 28 as we're looking at the man Jesus, his resurrection. And so I'm going to ask you to follow with me in your Bibles. Uh, I'm coming out of the New King James Version. You follow with me in your translation this morning. And so the Word of God reads as follows in Matthew chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came, uh, descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door, and he sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and they became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And so they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to bring his disciples word the heart of the message this morning church is this that the great greatest demonstration of the glory of God is the resurrection of Jesus the greatest demonstration of the glory of God is the resurrection of of Jesus Christ and so as we come to the gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus we come to that climactic moment toward which everything has been working and toward which everything has been building everything has been moving toward this moment in time the prophets of old had been moving toward this moment in time the life of Jesus on earth had moved toward this moment in time the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ because the resurrection resurrection of Jesus, that resurrection Sunday morning impacted the course of human history and altered the course of human destiny. And so the Bible tells us that it is Sunday morning. Sabbath had ended Saturday night. This is the third day that the Lord had been in the grave. He was in the grave or in the tomb part of Friday. He was in the tomb the whole of Saturday. He was in the tomb part of Sunday. And so the Bible tells us that it's early, early Sunday morning. And just as the sun is about to come over the Mount of Olives, just as dawn is breaking, the women awake early and they've got themselves some spices to go and anoint the body of Jesus. And as we read all of the Gospel accounts, we find that uh, not only do we find Mary uh, Magdalene and the other Mary uh, going to the tomb, uh, but the Gospel of Mark uh, reports uh, Salome, the mother of James and John, going with them. Um, the, the gospel of, uh, that's the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Luke reports Joanna being with them. So we've got uh, Mary Magdalene, we've got the other Mary, we've got Salome, and, uh, and we have Joanna who make their way down to the tomb early that morning. And as these women make their way down to the tomb, um, they're having a discussion about who is going to uh, roll back the stone for them. But before we get there, something I want us to understand. As the women were making their way that resurrection Sunday morning toward the tomb, we need to understand that they were not going down to the tomb to expect a resurrection. They were going down to the tomb expecting to find a corpse. They were going to anoint a corpse, not to witness a resurrection. And whilst they're on their way to the tomb, they're discussing who's going to 
take away the, the, the stone from the tomb? Who's going to roll the stone away for us? They had no idea um, that Romans had been placed there to guard, Roman soldiers had been placed there to guard the tomb. And whilst they're going and they're having this discussion, the Bible tells us that there was a great earthquake. Now there have been some that would conclude that this earthquake was a result of the resurrection of Jesus from the grave, but this is incorrect. The Bible tells us that there was an earthquake because an angel of the Lord had touched down, and when he touched down on earth, the earth shook, and as the earth shook, the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb, and the gods shook for fear of them, and the Bible says they became like dead men in Matthew 28 and verse 4. The word used for earthquake is the same root word which is used to describe how those gods shook, and they, and they became like dead men. In other words, they went into a temporary coma when this took place. And the women uh, arrive on the scene. And they enter to the, into the tomb. But John tells us that Mary Magdalene didn't go into the tomb. John tells us that Mary Magdalene saw the stone that had been rolled away from the tomb and she ran quickly to take news to Simon Peter and to John. In John chapter 20 and verse 2, she, she approaches Simon Peter and John and she says, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Now church, I want us to understand something very clearly this morning. Contrary to what some people may believe, the stone was not rolled away from the entrance to the tomb to let Jesus out of the tomb, but to let the, the woman into the tomb. If we were to hold to this view and this understanding that the, that the stone was rolled away to let Jesus out, it would be absurd because that would suggest that Jesus had the power to bring himself back from the dead, but he didn't have the power to bring himself out of the tomb. And so the stone was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let humankind in. And this is what the woman witnessed that resurrection Sunday morning. So by the time the woman get to the, to the grave, by the time they get to the tomb, Jesus has already risen. Jesus is already alive, and the tomb is already empty. And so the other women went into the tomb, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Mary then returns with Peter and John. She shares news with them that there's something wrong. The stone has been rolled away. Our Lord's not there. And so Peter and John go running down toward the tomb that morning. And the Bible says the one, the beloved disciple John overtakes Peter and he gets to the entrance of the tomb first. But it suddenly, it's as though he gets there and he's not sure what to do. And he stops at the entrance of the tomb and he doesn't go in. And then Peter arrives and Peter pushes, impetuous Peter gets there, pushes him to the side. And Peter goes in to the tomb. And there he sees those grave clothes which had been wrapped around the body of Jesus to the side and then to the other side he sees the handkerchief that had been around the head of Jesus and neatly folded. And then John chapter 20 and verse 8, get a hold of this. And then John enters the tomb and he sees the grave clothes and he sees the handkerchief and he sees the empty tomb and the Bible says John saw and believed. How exciting is that? So Mary still wasn't certain. That someone's taken my Lord. But John sees the evidence and he believes. What beautiful and profound words right there. And then the Bible says that Peter and John return home but Mary remains at the tomb weeping. She's weeping for her Lord. She's grieving for her Lord. She's longing for her Lord. And as she's weeping at the tomb for the first time, she finally stoops down and she takes a look into the tomb. And as she does that, she sees two angels in white sitting there, one where, where, where Jesus' uh, head was and the other where Jesus' feet had been. And they turn to Mary and they ask her why it is that she's weeping. And in John chapter 20 and verse 13, she says, Because they have taken my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. And then Mary turned around and she saw Jesus. And she didn't recognize Jesus. And Jesus asks her a question. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And Mary says to Jesus, 
She says, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. In other words, what Mary was saying to Jesus is, if you have need of this tomb, just tell me. If you had to take away his body because you have need of this tomb, just tell me where you put him, and I'll take his body away. Oh, and church, get a hold of this. It is beautiful, and it is precious. John chapter 20 and verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary, just imagine that. Imagine how her heart must have leapt in her chest. That all too familiar voice that had called out to her so many times before, Mary, Mary, Mary. And as she turns and Jesus says, Mary. And straight away she recognized the familiar voice of her Lord. And she responded, Rabboni, teacher. And Mary goes to Jesus and she throws her arms around Jesus and she holds on to him. You see, she, she thought to herself, I, had, I thought I'd lost you once before. I'm not about to lose you again. Jesus says to Mary, you can't cling to me because I'm yet to ascend to the Father. But then he, uh, but then he says to, uh, to Mary, he says, go and tell the disciples in John 20 and verse 17, tell them that I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and I am ascending to my God and to your God and then we go back to the account of Matthew uh, 28 verse 7 where the angel instructs the women and says to them and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and indeed he is going before you into Galilee and there you will see him behold I have told you Earlier in Matthew 26 and verse 32, soon after telling the disciples that they will all be made to stumble because of him, Jesus says to his disciples, but after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. And so now the angel says to the women, go and tell the disciples that Jesus will meet them in Galilee. And as the women are on their way to tell the disciples, Jesus supernaturally tra uh, transports himself and he meets the women along the way. And here's what he says to them. He says, rejoice. That's a Greek word, karete. And it's actually a, a common greeting. And it's so beautiful. Get a hold of this. Jesus suddenly appears to the women whose hearts are, are heavy and whose hearts are burdened. And here's what he says. Good morning. That's what Jesus says to them. Good morning. It's just like, any other day, here I am. But it was a day like no other. Resurrection Sunday. And so Jesus converses with them. How cool is that? And the women fall on their knees. And they cling to his feet. And they worship him. But they need to go. And they need to take word into the city. And while the women are going to report to the disciples, there's another group of people who are in a hurry to get to the city. And those are some of the guards who had been guarding the entrance to the tomb where Jesus' body laid. And they're rushing into the city to report to the chief priests and to the Pharisees all that had happened at the tomb. Remember back in Matthew 27 and 62, the chief priests and the Pharisees approached Pilate and they said to Pilate, they said, Sir, we remember that this deceiver talked about being killed and talked about rising again after three days. And so what we're asking is that you would command a bunch of soldiers to make secure the entrance to the tomb until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and they steal his body and they have the audacity to say that he has risen from the dead and they say to, to Pilate so the last deception will be worse than the first what are they talking about what the chief priests and the Pharisees are saying is this it was bad enough just a few days ago when this man Jesus came into Jerusalem and there was a fuss over him and the crowds went crazy and now the last thing we need is, is for the crowds to hear that he is risen from the grave that would be bad for you Pilate and that would be bad for us and so Pilate says to them go and make it as secure as you know how make the entrance to that tomb as secure as possible and so they made the tomb secure sealing the stone and setting the guard 
Now some of the guards returned to the chief priests and they returned to the Pharisees panicked and they tell of all the happenings of that day. They tell about the earthquake. They tell about the rolling away of the stone at the entrance to the tomb. They tell about the appearance of the angel in brilliance and then sitting on, on, the, on, on the stone. And then they tell about the empty tomb. And all of the evidence, friends, points to a resurrection. And you'd think that the, the hearts of the chief, the chief priests and the Pharisees would turn. You'd think that they would believe in the midst of all of this evidence. You'd think that at best they would at least believe that this is true, or at worst they would go down to the tomb for themselves and they would explore the evidence. But they do not believe, nor do they even bother to go down to the tomb to see for themselves. Instead, how do the chief priests and how do the Pharisees respond? The Bible tells us they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, and here's what they say to them. You just need to go out there and here's the message you need to disseminate. His disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. I'll tell you one thing amongst many others, friends. Had the disciples stolen Christ's body? Had they been in a rush to get out of there? They would not have taken their time to take that handkerchief that had been around the head of the Lord Jesus and to neatly fold it. Another thing, had the disciples stolen Jesus' body, they would have to have got past all of the guards who were, who were guarding the tomb uh, that, that day. And it is highly improbable that they would have all been asleep. You see, the night was divided into four watches. And a watch would be uh, no longer than three hours and no less than two hours. And so what would happen is one guard would be on watch. And then after that he would go and he would rest. And the next one would come on duty. And I can assure you, and I'm pretty certain of this, the soldiers knew better than to fall asleep on duty on this particular weekend. If you were going to fall asleep, this was not the weekend to do it. Because after all of the attention that, that had been drawn to Jesus, they needed to be on high alert. And furthermore, for a soldier to fall asleep as, at a critical time such as this would result in him being court-martialed, which would then result in his death. And they had all of this overwhelming evidence, the chief priests and the Pharisees, and still they refused to believe. In fact, back in Matthew 27, uh, uh, we, we find that as Jesus uh, is hanging from the cross and the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees are watching and the Bible says that they're mocking Jesus. And in Matthew 27, uh, verse 41 to 42, here's what they say. He saved others and yet himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Well, they received reports, not, not only has he come down from the cross, but that he is risen from the dead, and still they do not believe. And instead, what's the attitude of the, the chief priests and the Pharisees? They turn to bribery and corruption. They bribe Judas with 30 pieces of silver, and now they pay off the soldiers. Just go tell them that someone came, disciples came and stole his body. Imagine that. The chief priests and the Pharisees, the ones who knew of the prophecies of Christ, the ones who should have been pointing people toward Jesus, the ones who, who should have been speaking about the Messiah to come, were the very people who were trying to shut down the good news about the resurrection of Jesus. Because it was all about themselves. They were so set on self, self-worship, self-centeredness, self-righteousness, self-piousness. How terrible and how tragic is that? And so they turn and they say to the gods, don't worry about a thing. We've got your back. If news gets to, to Pilate's ears, we'll plead your case. You have nothing to worry about. And so in Matthew 28 and verse 15, and this is so sad, so they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. And they took the money and they did as they were instructed. That Greek word instructed is the word didasko. It means to teach. So in other words, they took the money and they did as they were taught by the Pharisees and the chief priests. They had taught them 
to live this kind of lie. These religious rulers, just as they had been taught. The chief priests and the Pharisees had this overwhelming evidence which attested to the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel writers tell of the resurrection. They tell of the earthquake. They tell of the stone being rolled away. They tell of the appearance of the angel. They tell of the grave clothes being neatly folded. They tell about ten, at least ten separate appearances of Jesus after the resurrection. He appeared to Mary Magdalene, and then to the woman returning from the tomb, and then to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and then to Peter in Jerusalem, and then to the ten in the upper room, and then eight days later to the eleven disciples in the upper room, and then the seventh appearance was to seven disciples by the Galilean Sea. And then to 500 believers. And then to 11 and James's half-brother in Jerusalem. And finally to the 11 on the Mount of Olives as he ascended into heaven. All of this overwhelming, compelling evidence. And still, they refused to believe. And friends, there are many in this world who hear the gospel. And there's something that tugs on their heart. And they have the word of God with these great truths. But still, they refuse to believe. Well, perhaps there are many in this world who would say, we believe. But they don't commit. And they don't surrender. And they don't obey. And added to the overwhelming testimony of witnesses, was the witness of, witness of 12 frightened, timid men who became bold, courageous men who took the gospel of Jesus Christ into all the world. From Peter denying Jesus to standing up before that crowd on the day of Pentecost and he's preaching with boldness and he's preaching with conviction and he's preaching with courage and he says to the crowd he says that man Jesus whom you crucified God has raised from the dead he talks about how there is salvation in no other but the name of Jesus over and over and over again how is it that these timid men would become so courageous and so bold. It's because of what took place over 2,000 years ago on Resurrection Sunday because they know what they witnessed and what they saw. From these disciples who forsook Him and fled to courageous men preaching the gospel of Jesus to the point of martyrdom, dying for what they believe, save for John. And if this was some story that had been concocted by the disciples, there is no way that they would lay down their lives for a lie. But the resurrection is true. And Jesus is risen. And then the Bible tells us in Acts 17 and verse 6, these men who prior to this were timid, fearful men, they went and they turned the world upside down with the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. And friends, as we come to a close this morning, rejoice, for He is risen. And as we consider the resurrection of Jesus, friends, I want us to understand something here. We can deny it. We can refute it. We can argue it. We can debate it. But one thing we cannot do is we cannot ignore it. We cannot ignore the resurrection of Jesus because the resurrection of Jesus demands a response within the hearts of every man, every woman, and every boy, and every girl. And friend, if you're watching the sermon or if you're listening to the sermon and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to tell you that the resurrection of Jesus demands a response. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. The resurrection of Jesus has impacted the course of human history and it has altered the course of human destiny. And if you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, Jesus bids you come today. Will you come today? Will you place your faith in Jesus? Will you repent of your sin and seeking forgiveness? Will you seek to love, honor, serve and obey Him from this moment on? It is the greatest demonstration of God's glory. The resurrection 
of our Lord Jesus. Canadian scientist G.B. Hardy wrote a book entitled The Lie That Proves the Resurrection. And in it he writes the following words. He says, I have only two questions to ask. One, has anyone defeated death? And two, did he make a way for me to do it also? And the answer to both those questions is yes. Somebody defeated death over 2,000 years ago. On the cross of Calvary at the hill of Golgotha, his name is Jesus Christ. Did he make a way for us to defeat death and to have the assurance of eternal life? Yes, he did. And that changes everything. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 13 to 20, But if there is no resurrection from the dead or resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith also is empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile and you are still dead in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In this life only, if we have hope in Christ, friends, we are of all men the most pitiable. But listen to verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and I'm hoping as you're sitting in your homes that you're able to shout a great Amen that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and He has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And as John went into the tomb, he saw and he believed. And this Easter Sunday morning, friends, I ask you this question. Do you believe? Do you believe? And if you're watching the sermon or you're listening to the sermon and you do believe, then the question I want to ask you is how does the resurrection change the way that you live? How are you different because of the reality of the resurrection? How am I living in light of that great and glorious resurrection which changed everything? In a moment we are going to partake of communion. It is in remembrance and celebration of the finished work of the man Jesus where we see the greatest demonstration of God's glory in the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the King, the risen Lord. Bow your heads as we pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you we come before you with joy and with gladness and with thanksgiving. As we looked a couple of days ago on Easter Friday, the tragic reality of what took place on the cross, and then as you breathed your last and you declared those words, it is finished. It will always be finished. The atonement of the sins of the world finally complete. Humankind has been justified and the new covenant has been ratified. And as we looked at, at you, Lord Jesus, and we're reminded of you breathing your last, and that was on that Friday. But praise God that Sunday came. And Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have defeated death, and that you have risen just like you said you would. And herein lies our hope, and herein lies our confidence, and herein lies our salvation. And Lord, if there is someone who is listening or watching this morning who does not know you, I ask that by your Spirit you would draw them. I pray that you would remove the things that hold them back. It may be hurt, Lord. It may be past tragedies or disappointments or unanswered questions. I pray that you would remove those things, that you would unplug their ears to hear your call to them and that they would come and surrender. That they would come and seek your forgiveness for sins, Lord, as they confess of their sins. And then as they believe in their hearts, Lord Jesus, so they shall be saved. And then I pray from this day forward 
that they would make that decision to follow after you and to live in light of that great and glorious resurrection that took place that first Easter morning 2,000 years ago. And Father, for those who are listening and they believe, then may we live as a people whose lives have been changed. And as you change our lives, may you empower us with your Holy Spirit that we would follow after the path of the disciples and that we would turn the world upside down with this great and glorious news. And so this Easter Sunday morning we say thank you Jesus. Father, thank you for the greatest demonstration of your glory, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Amen. And amen. Brothers and sisters, we are so privileged to be able to partake of the bread and of the cup this Easter Sunday morning because of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus, which changed everything. And as we prepare to partake of these elements, there's only one prerequisite. And it is that we know and love the Lord as our Savior. And so won't you join with me, wherever you may be right now. And if you're sitting with friends right now, won't you have this conversation with them and tell them, the Lord is risen. And have them respond, He is risen indeed. And maybe you're sitting at home and you're on your own. Then I say to you, and if you would respond, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. And the Gospels tell us, as Jesus shared that Passover meal with his disciples and as he prepared to institute the Last Supper, the table of the Lord, the Bible tells us that as they were eating, Jesus took the bread and Jesus broke it. And Jesus gave the bread to his disciples. And he said to them, take and eat. This is my body. Church, won't you bow your heads as we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this bread. A symbol of your body which was nailed to the cross. A symbol of your body which was placed in the tomb. The symbol of your body that rose again. And as we eat of this bread this Easter Sunday morning, we thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. We thank you that this was all love, Lord. You did it because you love us while we were still sinners. As undeserving as we were, you died for us. And so we eat of this bread with hearts of gratitude this morning in remembrance of your body sacrificed for us. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Then the Bible tells us that Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said to them, drink from it all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And as the Jews would celebrate Passover, there would be four cups that would be recognized, four cups of Passover. There would be the cup of sanctification, 
And then they would celebrate and recognize the cup of proclamation. And the third cup, which would, would have been the cup that Jesus would have uh, drunk with his disciples, would be the cup of blessing. And then the fourth cup is the cup of praise. And Jesus said, I'm holding out on that one. One day in my Father's kingdom, when I have drawn my church to myself in eternity, I will drink with you in my Father's kingdom. But until then, Jesus said, we drink of this cup as we remember his blood that poured out for us. Bow your heads as we pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your precious blood. Your blood that poured out. Your blood that was sacrificed at a cost. Thank you for grace so amazing and grace so free for us, Lord. But oh God, thank you for grace because grace was so costly for you. Thank you that you faced and took the wrath of God for our sins that we might be set free. Thank you, Lord, for your precious blood that covers a multitude of sin. And as we drink, drink of this cup this Easter Sunday morning, we drink in remembrance of your sacrifice on the cross over 2,000 years ago. And then we look forward in great joy and anticipation when we will drink of the cup of praise with our risen Lord in your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And so, friends, come. Let us drink together in remembrance of our risen Lord. And let's think, look toward that day when we will drink the cup of praise in our Father's kingdom. Let us drink together. Church, won't you bow your heads with me as we close in prayer. Father, thank you for this precious time. And even though the current circumstances would have us in various places and in various homes, but Lord, we are the church of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, for whom you died and for whom you are returning. And thank you for this time as brothers and sisters all over the world that we've been able to celebrate. And I pray, Lord, that you would cause us and enable us, empower and equip us to be able to live in light of your resurrection and in light of your glorious and your imminent return. And that, Lord, we might live in such a way that as we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, we may tur turn the world upside down with this great and glorious truth. And now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ to whom be glory, forever and ever. Amen and amen.
My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my death And He called me His friend When death was arrested And my life began Oh, Your grace so free Washes over me You have made Rejoice, there's no heaven. 